I call Nicola Sturgeon for a point of order. Yes. Uh, my app didn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Sturgeon. We'll ensure that's recorded. Nicola Sturgeon. Does the First Minister agree that to keep the promise, the significant progress that has already been made it does need to continue and now intensify? In particular, does he agree that the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund is absolutely essential to provide the funding to transform services so that families are better supported and fewer young people then need to enter care in the first place? And to that end, will he give a commitment that this fund will be delivered in full and that it will be fully invested to improve the lives of the young people, present and future, to whom that promise has been made. First Minister. Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, can I recognise that there frankly would not be a promise if it wasn't for the efforts of the former First Minister, yeah, of yeah. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call on Nicola Sturgeon to be followed by Maurice Golding. Ms Sturgeon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking Maggie Chapman for securing uh, this important debate. This is a topic that goes to the very heart of the moral obligation, and I use that term deliberately, that developed countries owe to those in the Global South. The devastating effects of climate change are now impossible for any politician, uh, bar the mendacious, to deny or ignore. Here in Scotland, of course, as Maggie Chapman has just reflected on, Storm Babbitt has just delivered a tragic reminder that these impacts are now being felt everywhere, and my thoughts are also with those affected. But though global, the impacts do fall most acutely and massively disproportionately on countries that have done least to cause climate change, countries that are already poorer and less equipped to deal with the consequences of the emissions that have fueled the prosperity of those of us in the developed world. For example, the carbon emissions of countries in East Africa are negligible in a global context, and yet human-induced climate change has contributed to drought and famine there, a hunger crisis that earlier this year was estimated to be claiming two lives every single minute. Finance provided by rich countries to help the poorest deal with climate change is woefully inadequate. Shamefully, the much lauded $100 million a year commitment, first made 14 years ago, has still not been delivered in full. But finance, as well as being inadequate, is also far too limited in scope. Current funding covers mitigation action to reduce emissions and adaptation action to build resilience through, for example, flood defences. Both of these matter. Of course they do. They are hugely important. But not covered at all at this stage is the loss and damage being wrought by the impacts of climate change that are of a type and scale that can no longer be mitigated or adapted to. These impacts are already causing loss of life, loss of livelihoods and enforced changes to how and where people live. And they are doing so on a truly massive scale. Now, countries and individuals across the Global South have been campaigning for explicit recognition of and recompense for loss and damage for 30 years. And yet it was only at COP26 in Glasgow that the first glimmer of a breakthrough was made. I am very proud that Scotland played its part, becoming the first developed country in the world to pledge funding for loss and damage. Momentum continued last year at COP27 in Egypt with agreement to set up a dedicated fund and the establishment of a transitional committee to agree the detail. Again, Scotland was at the forefront of efforts to make that progress. However, it will be at COP28 in Dubai in just a few weeks' time that we will know if these promises are to be honoured. Indeed, if it is any longer possible to expect Global South countries to keep face with the multilateral process at all. I hope for the best, but already fear the worst. By all accounts, progress in the transitional committee is nowhere near where it should be. So in the short time I have today, I simply want to add my voice to those demanding true climate justice. COP28 must ensure that the loss and damage fund becomes operational 
without delay. It must be open to all developing countries. The finance it offers must be additional to that already available for mitigation and adaptation. It must be in the form of grants, not loans. To deepen the indebtedness of developing countries would not address injustice, it would compound it. And it must cover the full range of the loss and damages being suffered. Uh, that means uh, not just the impacts of sudden events like floods and storms, but also slow onset climatic changes, um, and also not just economic loss, uh, like damage to infrastructure, but non-economic loss of life, culture and heritage. Uh, my final call, presiding officer, before I conclude, uh, falls closer to home. I understand, probably more than most in this chamber, the financial pressures confronting government, but I do ask the Scottish Government to ensure that our overall Climate Justice Fund commitment for this Parliament, increased during COP26, is delivered in full. And that, as a bare minimum, and I stress bare minimum, we honour in full the world leading commitments made to loss and damage funding. This is a matter of basic justice. It's the obligation we owe to those in the Global South paying the price of our prosperity. I hope Scotland continues to lead the way. I now call on Nicola Sturgeon to be followed by Carol Mockin. Ms Sturgeon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this is my first speech here solely as the MSP for Glasgow Southside. And it's also the first programme for government in 17 years that I've not been involved in as either First Minister or Deputy First Minister. So to say that my perspective on politics has altered uh, would be something of an understatement. Certain things look different, uh, perhaps a bit clearer, in fact, from here than from the trenches of the political front line, and I'll perhaps return to that later. Uh, firstly, though, straight to yesterday's programme for government. Uh, I enthusiastically commend it. Um, I can't claim to be entirely objective, but in my view, it does strike a good, the right balance between building on progress and breaking new ground. Uh, much has been said, of course, about the importance of the economy. Uh, rightly, there can be no strong society without a strong, sustainable economy. However, the opposite, uh, while just as true, has traditionally had less attention. It has been right, therefore, uh, in my view, to address this. And I commend the First Minister for keeping the mission for a fairer society where everyone can contribute to and benefit from the fruits of the economy very firmly in vision. Uh, the economy will not, uh, never will, flourish when systemic barriers prevent people accessing the labour market, especially when lack of population growth is one of the most significant challenges we face, or when poverty robs too many people of opportunity and fulfilment. I am extremely proud of the doubling of early years education and childcare, a vitally important infrastructure project as well as social initiative. And I'm proud too of the establishment of the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, these deliver immediate benefits, especially to the 90,000 children being lifted out of poverty right now. But the real value of these, of course, will be long term. In that vein, I very much welcome plans uh, to further expand childcare. The pilot that was announced yesterday is a sensible approach, uh, and I hope very much that it will lead as soon as possible to mainstreamed provision. I also want to take the opportunity today to mention the promise to our care experience young people, a mission that is and always will be very close to my heart. Yes. Ross McCall. I uh, thank the member for the intervention. The member will be aware of the Promise Oversight Board. Um, they had a report that came out in June of this year where the board states that it doesn't believe that delivering the aims of the Plan 21-24 is realistic by next year. Does the minister agree with the Oversight Board's assessment? Nicholas Sturgeon. Um, I, I uh, do believe that that is the case right now, but I don't believe that that is inevitably uh, what has to be, which brings me exactly to the point I wanted uh, to make. The promise is and always will be a mission very close to my heart, and this is very relevant to the point the member raises. 
As on so many areas, there is a need to make up for time lost to the pandemic. And that is why I do welcome and applaud uh, the focus that a new Cabinet subcommittee will bring. Uh, the promise is, of course, about improving the lives of young people in care. But we must also remember uh, that it's about something else as well. Supporting families better so that fewer young people need to go into care in the first place. And to that end, I look forward to hearing about progress in financing and implementing the critically important whole family wellbeing fund. Uh, the other aspect of the programme for government that merits, uh, I'll take uh, one more intervention. Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I thank the member for taking that intervention and I recognise the contribution of the whole family wellbeing fund but will the member recognise then that 18 months into the pilot in Glasgow not a penny has been commissioned yet and there are organisations like the Govan Help who are critical in delivering these services who really need some of that money. Nicola Sturgeon. Yes, I do. That's why I think progress does need to be uh, accelerated, which is why I mentioned that point. The other aspect of the programme for government that merits close attention is access, uh, action to accelerate the green transition, essential to safeguarding the planet and building a fairer society, but also the most important opportunity we have to achieve sustainable economic growth. Um, I welcome plans to take forward the recommendations from the FM Investor Panel established towards the end of my time in office. Moving away from fossil fuels, which we must do, doesn't mean turning off the North Sea taps overnight, as some mischaracterise, uh, but turning on new taps, and the First Minister is right to criticise the UK Government approach, uh, makes only a marginal, uh, at best, difference to the lifespan of the North Sea, but comes at a heavy cost to the environment um, and also to the focus we need on building renewables capacity as quickly as possible. Uh, lastly, on climate, I look forward uh, to seeing Scotland's world-leading commitments on financing for the loss and damage suffered by the Global South taken forward fully. Uh, I want to conclude, Presiding Officer, with a few words, not so much on what we do here, but on how we do it. Uh, before I do, let me say that I accept my share of responsibility for the state of our political discourse. Uh, if anything, though, that makes me more determined to play a part in trying to change it. Uh, Polarisation in politics is much maligned. It is the paralysis of action that it can result in, though, that should worry us most. Uh, so perhaps we need to, as we embark in a new term, have some principles in mind to guide us. Firstly, a collective recognition that the challenges we face require tough decisions. These are by definition hard, they're often unpopular, and will always meet resistance from those who benefit from the status quo. Uh, that's not an argument to ignore those voices. Uh, but it is important that we make sure that they don't become an automatic veto on the change that is necessary. Second, an acceptance that we can't just wish for the ends uh, of our policy objectives. We must also have the means to deliver. That means mature debate on how we pay for our policy priorities, but also on the powers this Parliament has and needs. Uh, I want this Parliament to be independent and believe it soon will be. I don't think I'm creating news with that statement. But that will never stop me arguing for incremental change along the way. And likewise, those who oppose independence shouldn't close their minds to new powers that allow us to better tackle the big challenges we face in the here and now. And finally, presiding officer, disagreement and robust debate isn't just the essence of democracy. It's part of what makes us human. Uh, but the dynamic that it creates is not fixed. First Minister, That's you will need to conclude. I'm oh, sorry, Nicola will Sturgeon, you will need to conclude. and stalemate, or can we use the creative tension to drive improvement for all? I hope that in this term we see more of the latter than the former, and I look forward to playing my part in Thank it. Thank you, Ms Sturgeon. I now